This video is sponsored by Squarespace. In this video, we'll be examining the peculiar animal known as the Auto Cascade Refrigerator. In earlier videos, I explained the inner workings of a typical vapor compression cascade cycle, which uses two refrigeration loops with two different compressors for two different refrigerants so that you basically have one refrigerator cooling a second refrigerator so that it can get even colder. The Auto Cascade system also uses multiple refrigerant loops, but just one compressor. The compressor compresses a mixture of two different refrigerants with a fairly large difference in their boiling points. For my system, refrigerant 1 is propane and refrigerant 2 is ethylene, although a more common second refrigerant found in a commercial system might be R508 or ethane. There's also some oddball systems out there that use CO2. In this case, the partial pressure of the first refrigerant is high enough to liquefy in the condenser just like with a regular vapor compression system, but the second refrigerant is still gas. Oh yeah, and let's not forget the oil separator. Now here's where things get interesting. The gas liquid mixture flows into a chamber called a phase separator that uses gravity and some baffles to separate the gas from the liquid by letting the liquid fall to the bottom and the gas rise to the top. Since the first refrigerant has already condensed to liquid, but the second refrigerant is still gas, this pretty much completely separates the two refrigerants. The liquefied refrigerant 1 goes into an expansion valve or capillary tube, its pressure drops, it boils in an evaporator, then returns to the compressor inlet just like with a regular vapor compression system. And just like with a standard cascade system, the evaporator is actually one side of a heat exchanger. Now at the same time, the gaseous refrigerant 2 leaves the phase separator through the top and flows into the heat exchanger where refrigerant 1 is evaporating and getting really cold. The combination of high pressure and low temperature of refrigerant 2 now causes it to condense, at which point it goes into a separate expansion valve or capillary tube where its pressure drops and it boils in a second evaporator, which is the the business end of this whole system, which gets chilled to the boiling point of the second refrigerant. After that, refrigerant 2 exits the evaporator through the gift shop, then returns to the compressor inlet. Now in some schematics, I've seen them add a check valve on the return line, which I guess is to prevent one refrigerant from backfeeding into another one's evaporator, but I don't actually think this is necessary, and mine ran just fine without it. Okay, so that's how an auto cascade cycle works. Now the obvious catch here is that your compressor needs to work a lot harder than it would in a standard cascade system because it has to generate enough pressure to condense refrigerant 1 at ambient temperature plus the pressure to condense refrigerant 2 at the heat exchanger temperature. In my in my case that was about 11 bar for propane at 30 C plus 22 bar for ethylene at minus 25 C so a total of 33 bar absolute or 460 psi gauge. So yeah the compressor is very unhappy and I actually had to make a circuit to switch it on and off because running at 100% duty cycle would overheat it. Anyway that's the theory let's actually build it now. I start with the phase separator, which has a baffle on the inlet to prevent the liquid from getting sprayed. Then that's brazed to a 1 inch cap with a gas outlet tube, and it goes on this 1 inch pipe which has a smaller liquid outlet tube on the bottom, which is the right side here. Since this is a multi-stage system, we'll need an oil separator. So I've got a trusty Temprite 320 which has copper lines brazed to the stainless steel using SSF6 brazing rods and a quarter inch flare nut on the oil drain line. The compressor is meant for a 10,000 BTU window unit or about 800 watts max. I found it on eBay for about $30 in perfect condition, so super lucky. For oil return, I've got a high pressure solenoid valve with quarter inch flare fittings on it. The coil runs off 120 volts AC. The oil separator, solenoid valve, and associated tubing are all brazed up to the compressor and then I add a condenser with a big 12 volt 6 amp fan for cooling. The filter dryer is added to the outlet of the condenser. Then the outlet of the filter dryer is plumbed to the inlet of the phase separator, which is expertly fastened to the system with a plastic zip tie. This 40 plate heat exchanger will serve as the evaporator for refrigerant 1 and condenser for refrigerant 2, but it uses 3 quarter inch NPT fittings which I need to adapt to quarter inch flare fittings. I doled out my bigger drill bits earlier, so to cut out the holes in the 3 quarter inch caps I used my CNC. Total overkill, but it made a perfect fit. Then, using a whole lot of flux, I brazed the two fittings together with a copper phosphor rod. Here's how it looked after cleanup. 
Then I made three more of those and screwed them onto the heat exchanger. NPT fittings don't seal worth a damn, so you typically have to use something like plumber's putty to seal them, but I found that it doesn't work very well for the bigger threads at high pressure, so instead I use silicon caulk. It may sound a little crazy, but I've been using it for quite a while now to seal threaded fittings, including on my cryo cooler for making liquid nitrogen, and it seems to hold up perfectly fine over time. After allowing the silicone to cure for 24 hours, I pressurize the heat exchanger and do a leak test by submerging it and looking for bubbles. Looks perfect. Then it's covered in a half inch thick foam insulation box with the gaps taped up so that warm air can't leak in from outside. Next we've got a one millimeter inner diameter capillary tube with a quarter inch flare nut to connect from the liquid outlet of the phase separator to the evaporator side of the heat exchanger. For the return line I've got a 5 8 inner diameter tube running up to the main evaporator which is a coil made from 3 8 inch diameter tubing. Oh, by the way, that big yellow thing is a 5 gallon or 19 liter tank for holding all the refrigerant in gas phase. The buffer tank will connect to the system with this T. One side of the T is for the tank and the other side is for a fill valve. The middle of the T is braced to the low pressure return line, then I brace some 3 16 inch tubing to quarter inch NPT caps for the pressure gauges which will have small capillary tubes running out to them. But before I go melting more metal, I need to figure out a way to afford more fuel. So let me tell you about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Now, unless you want to spend the rest of your life in a cubicle working for the man, you're probably going to want to start some sort of business. And if you have a business, a wooden sign isn't going to cut it. You're going to need a website to reach people, and it's going to need to look professional. And Squarespace is the perfect service to make that happen. Squarespace provides all the tools you need to build and host a website for your business. AI-assisted graphic design, media integration, payment processing, inventory management, appointment scheduling, traffic analytics, and even the ability to run ads on social media. Squarespace has it all in one easy to use system that doesn't require any programming or web development knowledge. Whether your business is selling lemonade to your neighbors or building intercontinental ballistic missiles, Squarespace is able to cover all of your website needs. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial and if you want to launch a website, go to squarespace.com slash hyperspace pirate to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. Okay, back to brazing. It's helpful to wrap these a couple times to serve as a strain relief so that there's not a bunch of bending stress right on the brace joint. The gauges are added to the caps and I wound the excess tubing into coils. The low pressure gauge line is of course braced to the low pressure return line and the high pressure gauge is braced to the high pressure side right before the condenser inlet. This bit of tubing goes from the evaporator outlet to the return line. And here I've got tubing going from the gas outlet of the phase separator to the condenser side of the heat exchanger where refrigerant number two will liquefy. This is the bottom of the condenser side of the heat exchanger where the liquid refrigerant two will exit. That runs all the way up the rack to the evaporator coil. I got this stainless steel bowl from Goodwill for a dollar which perfectly fits the evaporator coil. The bowl will be filled with alcohol to transfer heat from the load. That's then connected to the liquid line via a capillary tube and the other end is connected to the return line. Then lots and lots of insulation is added around the bowl and to the cold refrigerant lines. After evacuating the system, I gas it up partway with only propane to see how it behaves and while the pressures look normal, I'm immediately getting a lot of cooling on the second evaporator coil, which shouldn't happen since basically all of the propane should only be cooling the heat exchanger returning to the compressor. Then I realized I've got over 100 grams of propane refrigerant, which occupies almost 200 ml in liquid phase, but my puny little phase separator only has 40 or 50 ml of internal volume, so the liquid propane is overflowing through the gas outlet and traveling into the condensed proportion of the heat exchanger, which is really meant for gaseous second refrigerant. To fix that problem, I got a bigger tank to use as a phase separator, which has about 700 ml of internal volume. This is actually the same tank I used in my steam turbine video, so I'll want to bake it out in the oven to make sure all the moisture is gone. I also changed out the capillary tubes for needle valves on both evaporators to manually adjust the refrigerant flow. Okay, so now it's working as intended. The evaporator of the heat exchanger is cooled to minus 40 C without a load using only propane. So next I make some ethylene using my handy dandy automated ethylene generator and the ever useful jumbo beach ball for one atmosphere gas storage. 
Then I pumped up the buffer tank with the ethylene until the system had approximately equal parts propane and ethylene by volume. By mass, this came out to something like 110 grams of propane and about 70 grams of ethylene. The high side is now running at 450 psi or about 31 bar and the low side is about 65 psi or 4.5 bar. After fiddling with the manual expansion valves a bit, I got the main evaporator down to a chilly minus 81 C. Let's pop the cover and look inside. Uh, yep, that's pretty cold. It's got the magic mist and everything. With the cover off, it still manages to maintain below minus 50, which is still pretty good considering I've got this fan in the garage blowing ambient temperature air right onto it. That's all well and good, but we're going to need a fluid to transfer heat from the load, so I added about 2 liters of denatured alcohol into the bowl, releasing even more magic mist in the process. It's down at minus 70 and still not freezing, which is pretty cool. Let's stick this round bottom flask in the cold bath. I'm going to pipe in some propane and see if it will condense at atmospheric pressure. In theory it should be no problem because propane condenses at minus 42 C, but glass has pretty poor heat transfer so we'll find out if this is actually practical. I let it chill down to minus 76 while very slowly flowing in propane gas for about 15 minutes and came out with this. I think it's around 50 cc or so. To get better heat transfer, I built this funny little bracket thing to hold the flask down in the cold bath because the buoyancy wants to pop it out. By holding it all the way down, I'll maximize the heat transfer by having the entire surface of the flask in contact with the alcohol. Now let's try the propane thing again. Whoa, way bigger yield that time. Here you can see it boiling from tiny little nucleation sites in the flask. Sure enough, we've got minus 42 C, and just to show that it's actually propane, yes it is flammable. So if that works for propane, I should be able to make anhydrous ammonia, which only needs to reach minus 33C to liquefy. So I set up a big reflux condenser column to a flask of boiling ammonia solution and a drying tube packed with sodium hydroxide downstream of that. This should theoretically flow dry ammonia gas into the cold flask and condense it. And it seems to be working because I can already see some sodium hydroxide getting mushy from absorbing moisture in the gas stream. But when I pulled out the flask, I got absolutely nothing. Turns out, the drying tube was packed so tight that nothing could flow through it, so the ammonia was just forcing its way out the tiny gaps in the glass joints. I guess that explains why my garage smelled so bad, even with all the doors open and fans blowing. I replaced the tightly packed tube with this hilariously oversized drying jar instead. The white stuff is sodium hydroxide. I also left the flask open this time so that excess ammonia gas could escape rather than just building up pressure in the system. And this time I actually ended up with some liquid ammonia. If I drop a little chunk of sodium metal in it, it should start turning blue from the formation of sodium amide. At first, nothing happened, but after a minute, the liquid turned deep blue and started to bubble up, so we're definitely making sodium amide. But as the reaction progressed, the blue spot got smaller and the whole thing became a white colored foam, and eventually all that was left behind was just this mystery liquid and some tiny bubbles. I think I had some moisture contamination in the ammonia, so while the mix initially formed sodium amide, once that reaction was complete, the amide started reacting with the water and just creating a solution of sodium hydroxide, which finally left us with this funny mystery liquid, which I think is just water mixed with a little bit of oil from the sodium storage container and some tiny bits of leftover ammonia bubbling out of solution. I tried doing the reaction a second time, but I got the same end result minus the deep blue color, so I guess I gotta get better at drying my ammonia. Anyway, back to refrigeration, I added around 15% water to my denatured alcohol, and at minus 70 C, it ended up making a pretty funny looking slushy, but never quite seemed to freeze over solid. You know, this would actually be a pretty good margarita if the alcohol wasn't denatured. The next morning, the cold bath had turned blue. I guess a decent chunk of the ammonia had dissolved into the water and reacted with the copper, making blue copper hydroxide. And after chilling the mix again for a few hours, it made these insanely cool looking crystals. It also made the frozen mixture more like a gel than a slushy. Okay, so that's an auto cascade system and some of the things we can do with it. Now the last thing I want to look at is performance figures. Here's the temperature versus time graph for a 9 hour run. In blue is the cold bath temperature and in red is the compressor casing temperature. As you'd expect, when the compressor is switched on, the temperature rises and when it's switched off, it starts falling. With the cold bath temperature, the downward slopes happen when the compressor is on, as you'd expect, because it's being cooled, and the flat lines happen when the system is turned off, because there's no cooling and it's very 
well insulated. By determining the rate of change of the temperature when the system is running, then multiplying that by the heat capacity of the water alcohol mix, I can get a rough picture of the refrigeration power versus temperature. The line is a little bit messy because I didn't have very high resolution data, but qualitatively it makes sense because the refrigeration power starts off high at room temperature, then approaches zero as it reaches the ultimate temperature, which is about minus 82 C. For comparison, here's the power versus temperature graph for the conventional cascade system I built. Both actually consumed almost the same input power, averaging around 750 watts, which makes this a fair comparison. Even though both systems seem to have about the same power below minus 70 C, above that temperature, the regular cascade has dramatically more, meaning it'd bring the load down to minus 70 C way faster. The regular cascade system could also run continuously, whereas the auto cascade had to be limited to 50 to 70 percent duty cycle to keep the compressor from overheating. As for efficiency, the input power of the auto cascade system started at 800 watts at room temperature and then reached about 765 watts at minus 82 C. I'm going to oversimplify a bit and say it was a linear drop between those two temperature points. So then dividing refrigeration power by the input power, we get the efficiency or COP. And uh, yeah, suffice to say, we're going to be burning a lot of dinosaurs to make this thing cold. Okay, so what did we learn? Regular cascade systems are better than auto cascade systems, and unless you're stranded on a desert island with only one compressor, it's worth the slight additional complexity to build a cascade system with two compressors. Damn, I knew I shouldn't have flown Spirit.